Coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting bunker here at Area 52. This is the talk show Hell Hates. And the more you listen, the more you know why. This is Pastor Mike, and I'm online, and I am live today, and no one burned our house down last night. Um, as, as I thought would probably happen, looting, rioting, the burning of several businesses... Uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, last night, um, it went pretty much the way I thought. I didn't know what the grand jury was going to do. I didn't know what decision they were going to reach. Um, you, you, ne you can never know that. You're dealing with, uh, in the state of Missouri, you're dealing with 12 people. Uh, my wife did the research on this. Some states do have as many as maybe 16 or more people on a grand jury. In Missouri, the number is 12. Um, you never know what 12 people are going to do. We're, we don't know how the vote, uh, you know, was broken up. Uh, we don't know if it was all unanimous. We, we don't know that and cannot know that. Um, and the criticism that the St. Louis County Prosecutor Bob McCullough who has been that county's prosecutor for years. Um, he has won re-election numerous times. Um, and he, I, I'm just kind of just speaking for myself and people that I know. We don't live in St. Louis County, so it's not, we're not affected by what he does to, to the, as far as the judicial system is concerned. But um, he seems to have the respect and the integrity um, and the respect of the people in the community. They have re-elected him, as I said, many, many times to be the St. Louis County Prosecutor. He submitted all of the evidence to the grand jury, laid out a case, interviewed numerous people, uh, brought in the physical evidence, three different autopsies performed on Michael Brown's body, and the, the grand jury concluded that there was not sufficient evidence to proceed with a trial for any of the five charges that the prosecutor set before them, uh, ranging all the way from first-degree murder, which, as you know, is premeditated murder, um, which there was no evidence of that, all the way down to involuntary manslaughter. Involuntary manslaughter says that by reason of passion, you cause the death of another individual um, not, not by you're trying to directly kill him. Involuntary manslaughter means that the recklessness of your actions brought about the death of someone. Um, the evidence that came out, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time dealing with this, but it's, it's in the news and, and everybody's talking about it. We're, we, I am going to deal with um, right now, going on in St. Louis, uh, the Michael Brown's family, his mother and father, and Al Sharptongue um, are giving um, um, some sort of news conference. I don't know what's been going I, I haven't listened to it. I don't know what Al Sharptongue had. Excuse me. The Reverend Al Sharptongue. I don't know what he's saying. I can guess. I can guess at what he, based upon years of uh, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharptongue, and others uh, who have been called by some of their own people, poverty pimps, um, and the whole Raybone Coalition thing and, and all of the organizations that the guy, these guys are a part of, uh, they just stink with corruption. They really do. Uh, and I... I'm not afraid to say that. That's not, that doesn't make me a racist. It doesn't. Um, but anyway, I'm not going to spend all day talking about Mike Brown and, and so on and so forth. But the evidence was presented. The grand jury s sent out a what's called a no true bill, which means... We don't find the evidence here for you to be able to proceed to court to charge him with any of these five charges. Um, 
if you were watching, some many people from probably around the world were watching the press conference that Bob McCullough, um, when he came out and he read, which I thought he did an excellent job presenting um, what what had transpired, and basically said the forensic scientific evidence does not lie. The physical evidence, which are the some of the primary facts of the case do not have a political agenda. They don't have a persuasion. They don't have emotions to rely on. And he said the facts are the facts. The facts support a certain event that took place in spite of what other people said. The facts are, in fact, the facts. And that's pretty much what uh, laid the basis for the grand jury's decision. There was... Um, he opened it up for questions. I, I heard, after telling these people in this room that there is no way in the world to know who voted in what way in the grand jury because that is only the grand juries that they don't record what's said in the grand jury just like they don't record the deliberations of a trial jury. The vote, they don't know who voted which way. Nobody can know that. In spite of him saying that, at least three people said, uh, yes, uh, can you break down for us uh, how each person in the grand jury voted and what was their racial background? And he's going, I don't know, and nobody knows. Then there was a British guy, I don't know who he was, that asked the question and said, um, Basically, why didn't you stand up more? Why didn't you take a stand on this? Why didn't you, you know, why didn't you take a stand on this? And basically, this guy was thinking that the prosecutor had all this tremendous power in his hand, even power of the grand jury, and even though, even though the grand jury sent out a no true bill, McCullough could have said, I won't accept that. We're going to go forth anyway. He doesn't have that power. I, I don't know how it works in Britain. This man had an, he had an obvious British accent. I don't know how it works over there. I just know over here that the grand jury system is one of the foundational um, elements of our legal system. And I, I believe in it. I think it's a good thing, because I'll tell you what it does. Here is the prosecutor. He is the government. He represents the government. He is an agent of the state of Missouri, of the county of St. Louis, of the United States of America. He is a federal or a, a state worker. He is a government employee. The government should be limited in its ability to prosecute people for crimes. Why? Because absolute power corrupts absolutely in every uh, country that's ever existed. If the government has all the power, that means the people have none. And in the grand jury system, the, the Constitution gives the, the power to decide on certain cases whether or not they should be pursued. The government gives that power to the people, not to the government. It's 12 jurors who are basically just people from around town that come together. They examine the evidence. They know what's at stake. They're not sequestered. They can hear what's going on out in the world. And they looked at the evidence, 12 people, and said, there's no case here. There is no case here. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw something out here that I, I have not spoken to Darren Wilson, uh, the officer involved in the shooting. I've not talked to him. I don't know him. Was what he did legal? According to the evidence, a police officer has a right to, to defend himself against bodily harm, which would include death. He has a right to defend himself. Um, these car chases you see on TV all the time. If the culprit driving the car 
steers that car in the direction of an officer or an officer's vehicle, at that point in time, that person behind the wheel of that car has committed the crime of attempted murder. And the officer has the absolute right to fire his weapon at that person in that car and kill them. That's the law. We don't want a system in place whereby the officers that we send out to protect us, we do not want any laws in place that would limit their ability to defend themselves. We don't want that. That's not good. Um, are there bad cops? Yep. No evidence was presented that, that Officer Wilson was anything other than doing his duty. That's what we're hearing. Um, and the Reverend Al Sharptongue, among others, are feeding a notion in the hearts and the minds of people all over the world, but especially in St. Louis area and in cities all across America. They're feeding into the minds of people that the judicial system that we have in this country um, is wrong at its core. It should be changed. Do away with it. They keep calling the grand jury, this grand jury investigation, they keep calling it this secretive cabal that's going on. Everything's done in secret. I think there should be some oversight of that. There's a reason why grand juries meet in secret and deliberate in secret, and no one has access to that. There's a reason why. Anybody who would have access to a grand jury investigation, that same person having access would probably also have influence. We don't want a grand jury influenced by anything or anybody except the facts that were presented. Does it work every time? No. But it is the best system in the world at trying to determine who's right and who's wrong. There are going to be more buildings burnt. There are going to be more protests. There is going to be more anger on the face of Barack Hussein. Did you see him last night? He was ticked. And I, I can almost guarantee you, he and Eric Holder have a plan to throw Darren Wilson under the bus regardless of what the grand jury decided yesterday. I almost guarantee you. They're, gonna, they're not going to stop until this officer suffers for doing his duty while in the line of duty. Now, again, I don't know Wilson. Was his shooting legal? It looks that way. Was it the wisest thing to do? You and I cannot make that decision. We cannot make that decision because we were not there we were not part of the scuffle inside of that officer's vehicle. We did not see Mike, um, Mike Brown uh, apparently charging toward Officer Wilson. We didn't see that. So was it wise? I don't know. And I'm sure Darren Wilson is going to uh, probably go through this scenario in his mind for years did he do the right thing? Did he do the right thing? I'm just, I'm just thinking. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. If you were to ask him now, if you had to do all over again, would you shoot him? Would you kill him? Maybe he would say, knowing what I know now, there's no way in the world I would have done that. Maybe he would say that. I don't know. Anyway, people like Al Sharptongue, Jesse Jackson... Um, scores of others that hold this power over people because of what they say and how they say it. We're talking about pastors. 
Jesse Jackson, Al Sharptongue, and others in the black community. Um, that's something we've heard on the news ever since this whole thing went down, is pastors. Pastors getting together, pastors meeting, pastors talking about what should be done. Um, my question is, if Jesse Jackson was a reverend, a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where's the gospel? If Al Sharptongue is a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where's the gospel? He stands up behind microphones and pulpits all over this nation and says everything in the world and complains about everything in the world except the sinfulness of his own people. Have you ever heard Al Sharptongue stand up and address to his people how bad they have it in their communities, how sad it is that drugs and alcohol and promiscuity are taking over the young people. Have you ever heard Al Sharptongue preach on that? I've never heard it. Al Sharptongue stands up in front of black churches, black community leaders, and basically says that everybody else is the problem, but not us. Now, in case you're going... Boy, Hoggard's a racist. I'm going to turn that around. It's just as bad in white churches as it, in fact, maybe worse than it is anywhere else. It's just as bad. <sighs> Pastor Mike Hutzel, Pastor Brent Hutzel, and myself spent some time in Kenya back in August. We were preaching at a church in Kilimambogo, which means the hill of the buffalo. That's what it means. Little Buffalo Hill or something like that. Kilimambogo. It's a small, small village with a mosque in it facing Mecca. Um, we were preaching there. There was quite a few pastors there, and the pastor of the particular church building that we were in, they were. we could tell that these men were desirous to hear the Word of God preached. So we did. And I'm seeking the Lord every day, God, you, you, you deal with me, you show me what, how, what direction you want me to go. Um, it was decided before we left that, um, that Pastor Brent would deal with areas of church administration. That's his gift. Um, Mike Hutzel would deal with issues of evangelism. That's his gift. And they laid it upon me to deal with issues of doctrine and the Bible. And so I basically spent three or four sermons just sort of building them up to showing them what was wrong with their Bible. Um, they would use the Swahili translation uh, along with probably an English Bible. One of the mistakes, I've made this mistake before, and I, I, try, to, I try to think about where people are coming from when I speak to them. One of the mistakes that can be made um, is to just go in, beat them over the head with a King James and say, it's this way or I'll never come back here. You people are infidels. I don't like doing it that way. I don't know, didn't know where these people were as far as their relationship with the Lord or the walk with the Lord. So what I did was I just prayed about it. I asked God to lead and God did that. And on the day that I began to show what was missing out of their Swahili Bible, what was missing out of the New International Version, what was missing out of the New English Bible or the New American Standard, the verses that were missing, things that had been corrupted, things that had been changed. Mwana wa mungu, which is Swahili for son of God. 
And I asked them, do you believe, the, do you believe in the Moana Wamungu? Yes, Jesus, the Son of God. Is he a Moana wa Miungu? Miungu is plural for God. It means gods. No, no, no. And I said, open to Daniel 3, 25. And they read it, and they looked at it, and their jaw dropped. They'd never seen that before. And so I gave about four verses. The pastor stood up, and I went, oh, no. And he said, I've heard enough. And I'm just going, oh, I did it. We're fixing to get thrown out of here. The United Nations is going to have to be called in to rescue us. And he said, I realize that I've been preaching out of a book for 20 years, but I have not been preaching from the Word of God. And from that day forward, that man's mind had been made up that there was an incorrupt Word of God that needed to be preached to his people, and he, he had decided he was going to do that. Now, I could go and do this same thing in American churches. In fact, have. And I will be ridiculed name-called, um, never asked back, never invited back by, by white churches, white pastors. If you don't accept the Bible as the Word of God, what do you have? You have the mouth of men who are going to say things not based upon the authority of God, although they're going to try to get you to believe that it's the authority of God, but it's not. They don't want you reading your Bible. They don't want you in the Word of God. They don't want you to know that what they're saying to you is not true. They don't want you to know that. They want you to think that they are some big hotshot deal. Um, a young man from Kenya emailed me yesterday, um, and he said, "And he said I am concerned. I, 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 um, I encouraged him because of his remarks. He said I am, I am concerned. He said I'm, I'm from Nairobi. I used to be part of Doctor Owar's congregation. Doctor Owar, it's O W." O U something, I don't know, R. He is this big, big, big mega church hotshot in Kenya. He has this huge following. You go to his website, you're going to see miracles on that website. You're going to see the glory cloud of God appear out of nowhere. You're going to see a picture of light beams shooting off of Dr. O'War while he's preaching. That is God's sign that he is a, he's the designated man of God, and you should fear and listen to him. And this, this young Kenyan e emailed me, and he said, I left. He said, there were things that he was, he was saying that I knew were wrong, and he said, I'm out. Do you know of a King James church anywhere around where I'm at so I can go to church? And so I, I emailed him back, and I commended him and everything like that. But Dr. O'War basically says that he got to go to heaven, that he took a trip to heaven. He talked with Moses and Elijah and Jesus, Talk to all of them up there. They let him see some things. And he comes back down and he tells everybody what he saw and, and the fact that God had selected him to go see heaven and go see Moses and go see Elijah and go see all these things. God had selected him. And the, the reason why he tells people that is that he wants them to think that he is a big hot shot with God. He's way up there with God. He is a very special man with God. You puny people down here, you've never been called. Have you been called to heaven? Have you talked to Moses and Elijah? He wants those people to think that he is a, he's a wonderful man of God. Follow him. Do what he says. 
but he's a liar. He's a liar, and based upon some things that I have heard, he's an adultering, ad ad adulterating liar. And maybe even a pedophile liar. He's a liar. Well, how do you know that? How do you know he's a liar? Because I have a standard. I have something that I know beyond any shadow of a doubt is absolutely true. And it's called the Word of God. And there are many people in America, they're in South America, they're in Europe, they're in Africa, Australia, they're all around the world who refer to themselves by the title of prophet. Or they say that they got that God gives them dreams and visions on a regular basis, and that's what they operate in. They operate in the dreams and visions. Um, Stan Johnson of the Club O Prophecy. For in the nineties, I mean, I listened to the Prophecy Club just about every day, and I just I just had a you know had a thirst for knowledge. I wanted to hear what was going on. And there was some good stuff that come out then. Not all of it true. Some of it just, just panned out over the last 20 years to be absolutely bogus and ridiculous. But me and everybody else started noticing something. That Stan and his wife, who is a prophetess, she calls herself, by the way, um, all of a sudden now, they're not promoting the King James Bible so much as they're promoting their own dreams his wife's dreams, his daughter's dreams. One dream or vision that he said his daughter had, he published this in his newsletter. He said that his daughter, God gave her a vision of hell. And he said in this vision, she found out that there were actually two parts to hell. One was on fire. The other part was frozen. It was like the Arctic. And according to his daughter's vision, she said that that's where all the dead church members go. Those who don't operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Those who um, don't speak in tongues. Those who just show up at church and don't do anything. That there's a different place in hell for them, and it's all frozen over. And I went, uh-uh. Where's that in the Bible? Stan tells me, Mike, not everything that God does is in the Bible. Really? How, do you, how can you say that? Because God is doing all this, and this is not in the Bible. Well, wait a minute. That's your logic? Your logic is not, God, not everything that God does is in the Bible, and the evidence... Is this vision that your daughter had? Well, God gave her the vision, and that's not in the Bible. See, I was right. You know what we're told to do? We're told to ask questions. We're told to try the spirits. Do you know what that means? Put them on trial. You know what you do when you put something on trial? You ask questions. And I already know from experience that there's preachers and pastors out there who don't want anybody asking questions. Why? Because they don't have a verse that answers it. So they don't want you asking questions. But that is precisely what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to put spirits on trial and find out whether or not they're telling the truth. Just like with the grand jury thing. Bob McCullough comes out and says, we heard lots of different testimony. Some of the testimony matched the physical evidence. Some of the testimony did not match the evidence. One, one part in particular, there was the story that Officer Wilson 
reached out of his vehicle through the window. The door was shut through the window and grabbed Mike Brown and, and started firing shots at him and that um, Brown was never in the car. Well, that's not true because there was a bullet inside the driver's door where Officer Wilson was trying to pull his gun and get this guy off of him, and he fired twice. And one of those rounds, um, I forgot what part it, it went through, but they found the gunshot residue inside that wound, meaning that was done at point-blank close range. The evidence did not support the testimony that some people were giving. In other words, they made it up. And what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to try the spirits. We're supposed to see whether they be of God or not. Because we have been warned over and over and over again that there are many false prophets and false teachers, many of them. And they're going to deceive people. And they're going to use their own words in order to do it. So let's just take a little journey through our Bibles. By the way, right, right up here. Hang on, let me get to it. Right, right up, right there, there, right there. Right up there is a new website, 666alert.net. You ought to go to it, all right? All of, those, um, all of those graphics, all those pictures, a lot of them you sent me in. Donna sent me one. Uh, Donna, the software lady, sent me one just right before the program today, um, and I posted it. This should be at the top of the list there. Um, but all of these hexagons, these triple hexagons that we're seeing everywhere, all these sixes that we're seeing on stuff, it, it's widespread. It's everywhere. There's something going on in this world, all right? So I, I decided this, this week to put up a website dealing with that, and uh, you can go there. Uh, share that website. And uh, on that website, check back from time to time. I'm going to uh, be kind of, uh, be putting up some um, maybe some teachings about w what this number represents, what it means, and so on, um, hoping maybe people would be interested and it would lead them to having the Word of God sown into their heart and into their life, because everybody's curious about the number of the beast. Everybody is. So anyway, and if you see anything out there, take a look at the website, kind of get what I'm looking for. If you see anything out there, send me the picture, all right? And uh, we'll be glad you can send it to pastormikeonline at gmail.com. And um, I will, um, and if you send me a picture of a 666 anywhere, you can have a free download of any video of your choice from YouTube, all right? That's just, that's our offer to you. All right, now, let's examine the Scriptures. They say that there, there are prophets now. Dr. Owar is one of them. These latter-day prophets who are prophesying all of these things that are good. They're saying, oh, God's given me a new vision. I've got a new prophecy here. I've got, I've got a new word from God here that I'm going to lay out for you. Oh, I just, oh, I had a vision last night. I had a dream last night. I'm going to tell you the dream. And God's, boy, God's got something big planned. He's got something going on here. I admit to you, when God called me into a prophecy ministry in 1997. I had, I had no idea where it was going, had no idea what God was going to do, but I was, was God, wherever you want it, whatever you want to do, you do it, all right? And so I just left it in the hands of God. But I, I started reading some things. I started listening to some things and so on, and, and there was these guys that were having visions. They were having dreams. They were Latter-day prophets. One came, was, uh, came to the St. Louis area, um, and I went to hear him. And he talked about all these things that God gave him a vision of and how they were going to happen. And during the course of the talk, he's giving his resume 
Uh, the newspaper had done an article on him that he had prophesied certain event happened, and lo and behold, it happened. So he's giving us his resume and telling us, you know, I'm, I'm hearing from God here. Um, it was promised that when he came to St. Louis that he would receive things of God that were going to happen in the St. Louis area, and he would tell those things. That was in 19... I'm going to say 1998. None of them happened. Not one. None of them did. And we'll find out later what the test of a prophet is, but I can tell you, if you prophesy six things and none of them happen, you're not a prophet. Or at least a really bad one. But you're not you're not a good prophet. I can tell you that. And at one and I was listening to some of these guys: uh, Dan Bowler, Henry Groover, Dimitri Dudeman, some of these others that were having visions all the time. And God was showing them this, and God was showing them that. And and I admit, at one point, I asked God to give me dreams and visions. I asked God that probably two or three times. And every time I prayed that, the Holy Ghost, I had my Bible sitting right in front of me, open my eyes, Holy Ghost said, here's your dreams, here's your visions right here. Here they are, right here. And about the third time that happened, I, I, I submitted to that. I said, God, I will never ask for this again. I believe that this Bible has everything that I need to know and everything that everybody else has needs to know. And I'm going to stick with this and what it says. Now, I have had some dreams that to me are very interesting. That I thought maybe were prophetic in some way. I've got them written down. I haven't had one of those in a long time. But I've got them written down in a notebook. I don't remember where the notebook is. But I've got them written down. You want to know what they are? I'm not going to tell you. You know why? Because I don't trust them. I don't trust them. And I don't want you to think you can trust them either. My dreams. Because here's the question. How would you know if I ever dreamed it? How would you know? I mean, I could be lying. I could be, I can make this stuff up. Do you think? That some of these people out there that have they say, oh God gives me dreams. Ooh, I'm having a ooh, I'm having a dream right now. Ooh. You think these people you think these people might be making that stuff up to get attention? I was doing a meeting down in Alabama, and it was for the Club O Prophecy. And I was at the hotel meeting room. Uh, you know, just shaking hands, talking to people, this and that and the other. There was a guy in that that came in. Um, every time I see him in my mind, I picture Elvis because that's kind of what he looked like. And I and I, I can't remember if I ever greeted him or shook hands with him, but I I watched him go through that room. He went from one group to the next, meeting people, shaking their hands, getting in on the conversation, and then injecting there that God had showed him a vision of September 11th before it happened. And he said this to one group, and I'm just going, boy, I don't know about that. Then it, he went to another group, same thing. Another group, the same thing. And it's like, I know who you are. I know who you are. Uh, you're here to get people to notice you. You want them to think that you're some special prophet who hears from God and that you had envisioned or knew of the September 11th attacks before they happened. That's what, you, and you want people to think that you're some special big shot with God. And my question was, if you knew about September 11th, 2001, at any time before that happened, why were you not there 
Why were you not there um, uh, warning people? Why weren't you at the Pentagon with a video camera to see whether or not it was a plane or a rocket? Why weren't you there? He made it up. He invented it in his mind. He wanted people to think that he was some big so-and-so with God. And that is, from what I can see, what these guys are doing, what they're after. They're after men's applause. They want men to think that they're higher than they really are. That's, at best, that's who they are. At, at their worst, they want people to listen to them instead of listening to their Bible. And you can always tell them. How can I tell them, Pastor Mike? Well, I'll tell you. Thanks for asking, Timmy. You can always tell them because they will say or teach in some way that God is still giving latter-day prophecies to people that are not in the Bible. They'll tell you that. And they'll tell you that not everything God does is in the Bible. Well, how do you know? Well, I had a, I had a vision last night. That was from God. That's not in the Bible. And it's this circular reasoning that they use. So let's go to the Scriptures. Let's find out where we should get it from. If we're going to get it, if we want it from God, where should we go to get it? So Paul tells us in Hebrews 1, God who at sundry times and divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Notice the plurality of that. Many prophets. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So now I want you to notice the contrast as you look at this verse. We have many prophets in the Old Testament. We have one in the New Testament, his Son, who is the prophet. Jesus is the bishop of us. We are just under bishops. He is the chief shepherd. We're just under shepherd. He was the chief apostle. Paul and the others were just little apostles under Jesus Christ. And just kind of get that idea. Uh, I've used this analogy of think of the earth. Half of the earth is always in darkness, and the other half is in light. When you think about it, the multiple of prophets are like the stars shining on the dark side of the earth. And those who are in that darkness, you have these little prophets shining a little bit of light to them. Does it help them? A little bit. But it's not near as good as, as the sunlight. You and I, in these days, have God's Son, the Son of Righteousness, Malachi, rising with healing in his wings, to shine the glorious light upon us so that we can see clearly. We can see more clearly now than they could in the days of the prophets back in those days. And so we have many prophets in the Old Testament. We have one in the New Testament. But then you have all these guys that are referring to themselves as Latter-day Prophets. You have the Kansas City Prophets. You have, um, you have Todd Bentley and uh, some of his handlers. You've got the Kansas City Prophets. You've got uh, the Toronto Blessing. You've got the uh, Pensacola Outpouring and all the prophecies that are taking place down there. Charismatic churches everywhere where everyone has these private prophecies that they say are from God. One person uh, at a meeting in Iowa asked me, do you have a house prophet at your church, Pastor Hoggard? Um, yeah, I do. Um, his name is Jesus. They said, no, 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 no. You have to, you have, to have a, a, a man in your church that is hearing from God and will give to the bishop or the shepherd the words of God, and then the shepherd will give it out to people. I went, are you, are you crazy? What that, you know what that was? That was a religious way 
to remove both the authority of a bishop and the authority of the written word of God out of that church. Because what they had done, they had set up a little Babylonian Roman Catholic system whereby the word of God and the bishop was to be subject to another man who was going to hear from God things that were not in the Bible. It's exactly what the Vatican does. That's exactly what Joe Smith uh, built the Mormon church on. That's what essentially what the J-dubs, the Jehovah's Witness, are built on. Oh, so yeah, they have the Word of God, but it's our interpretation of the Word of God that you need to listen to, not the Word of God itself. That's what's going on everywhere. That We call them cults. It's what we call them because that's what they act like where all of the authority and all the wisdom from God is being given to this special person or personette. Some churches don't have a house prophet. They have a house prophetess. They have a woman who is constantly hearing new things from God, and she has every right in the world to correct that pastor and correct the word of God by what it is that she says. It don't take me but about two Bible verses to put that one away. But this is, this is where we are right now. People, people have gotten bored with the Bible. They've gotten bored with it. It doesn't have any oomph in it anymore. It doesn't have that electricity flow that we feel in our church. So they got bored with the Bible. So what did they come up with? Latter-day Prophets dream people, vision people, prophesying and dreaming of this. and pro Oh, let me prophesy over you. Oh, God's giving me a word right now for you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Who does that? Um, Pat Robertson, 700 Club. Oh, God's giving me a word right now. I, I can see a lady in Tulsa, Arizona. You've got back problems. You've had back problems for years. God's going to remove that back problem for you right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Do you know that, do you know that he makes that stuff up? Do you know that? I just did. How easy is it for me to be right, for me to squint my eyes, talk like I'm in the spirit, and describe a woman in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who has back problems? How many people in Tulsa who are female have back problems? Raise your hand. They're all over the place. And there's, going to be, there's always going to be some woman in Tulsa with back pains going, oh, that's me. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. I accept that. I received that word. Hallelujah. They made it up. The Kansas City prophets, um, I can't even think of all the others. Here's what God said. Here's what God promised that he would do. God said in Deuteronomy 18, 18, I will raise them up a prophet. Notice the capital P. Let me, let me do this. Here's the magic circle maker right here. I will raise them up a prophet, capital P. King James translators knew who that was. <laughs> and they knew it wasn't Mike Bickle. They knew it wasn't uh, Benny Hinn. They, they didn't think that it was Pat Robertson. They knew it was Jesus from among their brethren. He was Jewish. Like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whatsoever, whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Now, one of the things that I know that latter-day prophets do is that they use fear. And they use this verse and others like it to tell you, if you don't obey me and you don't listen to what I tell you, because I'm a prophet, and if you don't listen to what I tell you to do, then God's going to get you. He's going to judge you. He's gonna, you're going to lose your salvation if you don't do what I tell you to do. That's what these guys do. They use threats, they use intimidation, they, they put fear in people. And these poor people are afraid that if they don't listen to these latter-day prophets, that God is going to inflict his wrath down upon them. 
And I hope, maybe, to set somebody free today by telling you, you don't have to be afraid of them. In fact, in fact, Deuteronomy 18, take your can of King James and turn it there. Big old can of fresh King James. My can's way back there. I can't reach it, or I would. Deuteronomy 18, turn there. Because in this same chapter, he's going to give you how to spot a false prophet. How to spot him. And I want you to see this in your Bible. I'm going to put it up on the screen, but I want you to see it in your Bible. In verse 20, But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods. Even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? And, so, and God already knows. He already knows what question you're going to ask. And maybe, maybe you're out there. You're listening to me, maybe for the first time or the second time, and and you, you've, been, you've been going to a church where they do prophesying or somebody did a prophes, prophecy over you or somebody did this thing over you, going to give you a word of wisdom or whatever, and you don't know whether it's of God or not. Remember, we're told to test the spirits, ask questions. Um, what was his name? Haggard. Not Hoggard. Haggard can't remember his first name. He was one of these mega church pastors out in Colorado. You remember him? He said that he had a vision, and God told him. This was after 9-11, right before we went to war with Iraq. For whatever reason, we went to war with Iraq. He had a vision, and God told him, that if he could get a million people to pray all at once, then there would be no bloodshed in this interaction with Iraq and that God would spare both us and them. So he sent this out to everybody. Oh, I heard from God now. I heard this from God. God said if we get a million people praying, then, then no Americans would die and the war started, and we started seeing body bags coming home. I wrote an email to his International Prayer Center, whatever, I can't remember what it was. This has been years ago. And asked them, um, according to Dr. Haggard, no Americans were supposed to die in this war. So I have to ask you, did we not get a million people praying? Is that what happened? Or was he wrong? And they wrote me back and said, well, you'll have to ask him that question. <laughs> it was him. It wasn't me. You know what the world found out about Dr. Haggard? That he was both a methamphetamine addict and a sodomite. Hiring male prostitutes with methamphetamine on them that's what the world found out about this guy. I didn't need to know that he was a sodomite and a meth addict. I didn't need to know that to know that he was no prophet of God. I had already made up my mind that he was a liar before all this came out about him. What, what was the criteria? Let's go back to the scripture. Test number one. Infallibility. They asked the question, how can we know whether or not this man is of God or not? He said in verse 21, And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing... Follow not nor come to pass, 
that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Look at the standard that God gives. All he has to do is be wrong one time. One time. Because he says, thou shalt not be afraid of him. He didn't say, then you don't have to worry about this prophecy. It's not what God said. God said, the prophet that speaks a word in my name, and it doesn't come to pass, you don't have to follow this guy. You don't have to be afraid of him. Because my prophets are right 100% of the time. Uh, this this kind of perturbs me a little bit. There are some people who will spend countless hours trying to um, trying to understand Nostradamus. They'll read his quatrains. They'll say, "I mean, this guy was amazing." Nostradamus uh, predicted Adolf Hitler. It says it right there. He predicted Adolf Hitler. Nostradamus said that Adolf Hitler was going to rise up, and there he was. Uh, no, that's not what he said. Nostradamus used the name Hister, not Hitler. Well, you know, that's close. But God's standard was that it would be right 100% of the time. And that when it happened, it would happen exactly the way the prophet said it would happen. It would happen according to the word of God. Exactly that way. That's the, that's the test. That's, that's rule number one. Test number one, infallibility. If they are wrong one time. And I'll, I'll just, I'll, here's what I think. I think God will make sure that all these guys are wrong at least once. He'll make sure of it. God will not let their prophecies come to pass. He'll make sure that they're wrong one time. Just so the rule, and just so that people would know and understand, this guy's not a prophet. He was wrong once. And when, I think his name's Larry. Larry Haggard, am I getting that right? When he came out with this, and it didn't happen, I knew for a fact he was a liar. He was wrong. He was not a prophet of God. God did not give him. God did not give him not only that. God didn't give him anything that came before or after that. It didn't come from God. It came from a lying, deceitful spirit or a lying heart. But it did not come from God. Ted Haggard. That's his name. Ted Haggard. Finally got it. So let's take this rule now and let's apply it to the Bible. Let's apply this rule to the Bible. Rule number one, this Bible, in order for me to refer to this book as the Word of God, it cannot be in error one time. Cannot be in error. There cannot be a mistake in this book anywhere. Not in Genesis, not in Chronicles, not in Revelation, nowhere. It cannot be, it cannot be wrong one time. So if you're looking for a reason to just believe the Bible is the Word of God, and it is above everything else, if you're looking for a reason to believe, here's one reason right here. The Word of God can never be wrong. It never was wrong. It is not wrong now, and it will not ever be wrong. It has to be right 100% of the time, or God himself said, you don't have to worry about what's in this book. You don't have to worry about one thing that's in here. Think of now why the devil is working so hard at disproving the Bible. 
why he is working so hard at corrupting the Bible, why he is working so hard to make sure that one prophecy doesn't come to pass. He's trying to make sure that it doesn't, because if just one of them fails, the whole thing is shot. The whole thing is gone. You don't have to abide by any of it. What would that leave us with? Absolutely nothing. We would have nothing if we don't have the absolute, inerrant, 100% right Word of God. Every word, every number, every concept in this Bible has a place, and it has a meaning, and it is 100% right. So that's rule number one. So I've heard people, oh, Pastor, you got to listen to this guy. He's like a prophet, and his, his record is just unbelievable. Most of the things that he said has come to pass. I don't believe him. I do not believe him. All he has to do is be wrong one time. That's God's standard. And then I heard, I heard people, when, when, there were people who prophesied about Y2K. You remember that? Four, 14 years ago. 14, 15 years ago, we were all just fixing to cash everything in, waiting for the tribulation to fall down from heaven because the computers didn't know what to do with themselves on January 1st, 2000. And then to, com to top it all off, you had these prophets running around, hearing from angels, hearing, getting visions from God, saying, Y2K is going to be awful. It's going to be people dying in the streets, and it's going to be this tribulation, and the beast is going to rise up, and it's going to put every mark on everybody's forehead, and it's going to be bad. And it never happened. Never happened. It was the biggest non-event in history. And then the people out there who either gave the prophecies or, or who uh, furthered the prophecies, now they start coming up with reasons why they were still prophets, even though they were wrong. Jonah was wrong. Jonah was wrong. Jonah said Nineveh was going to fail. Jonah was wrong. Go study Nineveh in the King James Bible. Go study it. You'll find out. God wasn't wrong. You'll find out. So, test number one. They only have to be wrong once. And if they're wrong one time, and I don't care if it's Hister or Hitler, you say, well, you know, the first, second, and, and uh, fifth, and sixth letters were correct. Yeah, but what about four and, you know, four and five or whatever, three and four? What about those letters? If they were wrong, they're wrong. They're not from God. Here's test number two. Test number two, direction. Where are they taking you? Let me um, hang on a second. Get ready. You're going to like this one, Okay. Deuteronomy 13. By the way, study Deuteronomy 13, Acts 13, Revelation 13. There's a false prophet in every one of those passages. Deuteronomy 13, Acts 13, Revelation 13. Deuteronomy 13. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder come to pass. Now let's let's stop right here. Previously, we learned that that the first test was they they they're wrong. If they're wrong once, you don't have to follow them. But let's just say that the other eight times they were right. And they had been right two or three times before they were ever wrong. And on that second or third time, you're going, man, these, this guy said it, and then it's happening. 
God even helps you with that one. He says, if they give thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, where have he spake unto thee, saying, let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So rule number two is, test number two is the direction they're taking you. If they take you in the direction of serving or going after a god or gods, it specifically says gods here, which is very interesting to me. Gods, in King James Bible terminology, gods refer to the, those in the angelic realm, immortal beings, angels, and I would say both good or bad, but let's just say that these are bad, Okay? Let us go after these angels. Let us, let us follow after these angels and what these angels are telling us, which are gods. Or let's pray to the saints, shall we? Let's pray to St. Jake and St. Harry and St. Matilda. Let's pray to all these gods. So, if that dreamer of dream or that prophet tells you a dream and a sign or a wonder and it come to pass, and then they say, let's go after other gods whom you have not known, God said, don't do it. Does the, um, the, uh, the secret of Fatima ring a bell with anybody? According to the story, three young people in, what was it, Lourdes, France, saw a vision of uh, the Virgin Mary. She appeared to them, took over their minds, gave them three prophecies. Um and apparently the first two came to pass. The third one apparently is this secret, and some people say, oh, no, that's been revealed. I don't know. I don't know if it has or not. The Vatican won't let it go. They will not tell us. I don't think they tell anybody the truth about what they prophesied. You know what my thing is? Who cares? Who cares? I don't base anything that I think that is going to happen upon the prophecies of Fatima, either known or not known. I don't base anything that I think or believe is going to happen based upon the prophecies of Fatima. Do you know why? Because these children were instructed in these prophecies, and all the glory goes to Mary, a goddess, not the Lord Jesus Christ, not God not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They all go to, all the praise goes to the saints and St. Mary and St. Joseph and all of these other gods. These visions had one purpose only, and that is to get people to think that the Roman Catholic Church was hearing from God, and they failed the test. They blew it. The prophecy of Saint Malachi. You know what I'm talking about? The prophecies of Saint Malachi, who allegedly prophesied the uh, every person who is going to be elected il papa, pope, all the way down to the last pope. And Saint Malachi allegedly said that the last pope is going to be Petrus Romanus. And, and that led people to believe that this Petrus Romanus was going to be the Antichrist. 
Books were written about the prophecies of St. Malachi and Petrus Romanus. Baloney, hogwash, lies, and deceitfulness. I do not believe them. I don't study them. I'm not going to promote them. I'm not going to tell everybody how good uh, these prophecies are and how dead on they are. And You need to read so-and-so's book on this thing, or you need to watch this video on this thing, or you need to get ready because we've got Petrus Romanus right now. But incidentally, that's who Francis the Talking Pope is supposed to be. He's supposed to be Petrus Romanus or Peter the Roman. I don't believe it. I won't preach it. I won't teach it. I will teach against it. Why should we devote any of our time and attention on an out-of-Bible prophecy, no matter how accurate you think it is, why should we devote any of our time and attention to this nonsense when we should be reading our Bible, finding out what God says in the real Word of God? I got, I got one for you. He said, if they show you a sign or a wonder, and then tell you, now open up your Bible, open up your NIV to this, because this book, this Bible, leads you to go after other gods. You say, well, how do you do that, Pastor? Mwana wa mungu. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. Is it the mwana wa mungu or mwana wa miungu? Is it the son of God or a son of the, what was it? Gods. Right here. NIV. So the prophet, the prophet of God, so in tune with God that he declares signs and wonders and they happen. And then he says, take your NIV Bible and turn to wherever. He's a liar. You don't have to listen to him. And you know why God sent him? To prove you. That's what he said. Go look at it. He said, I he said, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God said, these guys are going to come along to test you. You're supposed to be testing them. I sent them to test you. I'm going to prove to you and to everybody in the world that though you say you love me with all your heart, you don't. You're looking for signs and wonders. You're listening to guys prophesy that are not even in the Bible. And you're going worshiping after other gods. You're getting angel visitations all the time. You're taught to go listen to angels and that angels will tell you things and so on. God said, I'm proving you. I'm showing you and everybody else exactly what you're made of. You're out there telling everybody you're a Christian, but me and you, we know the truth, don't we? You're not really who you say you are. So here is... Here is God's servants, the prophets. That is a wonderful phrase in the Bible. 2 Kings 9, 7. Thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. By the way, Jezebel hates the real prophets. She hates them. I'd find out what spirit is in a church. Do they hate the King James Bible? And if they do, she's in there, and so are her prophets. 2 Kings 17, 13, Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. God's servants, the prophets, are going to tell you to read the whole Bible. And that the whole of the Bible is the word of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. That, that kind of debunks your idea that God does things that are not in the Bible because God said that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished in all good works. In other words, if God did it, it's in the Bible. 
And if it happened and it's not in the Bible, that wasn't God. That was not him. So God's real prophets will tell you, believe the word of God, believe the written record of God inside of your Bible. That's what they're going to tell you. 2 Kings 24, 2, And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord which he spake by his servants the prophets. Happened exactly what... And by the way, God sent them to give warning. Nobody listened. Acts 13, 48, When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified what? The word of the Lord. There it is right there, the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. Are you getting this? This is published. This is the word of the Lord, and this is what's published. God, God equates, watch this now, he equates his servants, the prophets, with the published word of the Lord. That's what he does. Amos 3, 7, surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. It's all here. Stop thinking that there are new prophecies out there that people, I, I did, I fell for this for a, a, a small time in my life. I thought, man, these guys are speaking the word. And I was wrong. I was dead wrong. And God just helped me. Man, God could have thrown me out a long time ago. And God just helped me. Mike, read this book. This is the sure word of prophecy. You want to know what's going to happen? If you'll start reading, I'll start teaching. I will show you great and mighty things that you know not. And instead of you having dreams and visions, which who knows whether you had them or not, God has taught me how to distrust me and trust only the written record of the Word of God. That's all I trust. You say, well, I don't know. You know, I know somebody, they have dreams all the time. It happens. I don't, I don't know that. I do not know that. That requires me, as, as you hear in court, that requires me to know the processes of someone else's mind. And there is no way in the world I can know that. No way in the world I can know that. So I just try to keep things simple. If it's in the Word of God, it's going to happen and did happen. And if it didn't, and if it happened, and it's not in the Word of God, it's not of God. And I want no part of it. Revelation 10, 7, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be... Study the mystery, by the way. Study mysteries or mystery. The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. He's told them everything already. Everything. It's all been recorded. It's all been written down. It's all there. Don't settle for anything less. You don't need it. Now he's going to connect what he means. Because you could be looking at this going, well, yeah, the servants, the prophets. And that's what I'm listening to these guys because they're on YouTube. They, I see this all the time. I see people uh, on Facebook posting God's word for America. God gave me a word for this country, and I'm going to shout this word out because it's from God. And I just go and, no, it's not, no, it's not, no, it's not, no, it's not. I don't, I don't trust that. I don't believe it. I, by the way, I don't have to. Because he makes the connection in Romans 16 that these prophets that God keeps talking about and the word of the Lord and his servants, the prophets, it's Scripture. Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. There it is again. 
which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Did you see that? How is it that God makes the revelation of the mystery known to all nations? He does so by the scriptures of the prophets. The scriptures. There it is right there. So he's connected it. The prophecies that you're seeking for, the words that you're trying to get understanding from of what's going to happen in these last days. Listen, I get it. I know the desire and the draw in life to want to know what's going to happen in this world, to, to love the study of prophecy. I do. A lot of people that I know don't. My wife doesn't. She doesn't sit around and help me do research and write Watchman broadcast scripts. She doesn't. And I'm fine with that. That's not what God called her to do. God uses her to keep me on a pretty good path. Not everybody in my church is all eager to hear the latest prophetic word from my congregation. I don't, that doesn't bother me. I, I don't mind that. But I know the feeling of those of you who desire to know. You have a thirst for knowledge. You want to know. You want to know what's going to happen. You want to, you want to understand and perceive things and warn people. I get it. Don't pass out anything that's not true. Don't make public things that are absolutely untrue because the moment you do, you've become a liar. I'll give you, a, I'll give you an illustration. Those of you who are on Facebook, you can go to my page. My wife and I were looking through Facebook last night, watching the news at Ferguson, trying to glean some other things from Facebook that were going on, see what people were saying about it. Some, oh my goodness. Somebody posted a video. It's on YouTube. It is one of the dumbest, ignorant investigations I've ever seen in my life. The subject of it was, was that the Ferguson shooting was a hoax. It never happened. It was a scam. It was crisis actors. Mike Brown never died. No officer shot him. That's all a hoax. It's a scam by crisis actors. And I watched this video last night and steam shot out of my nose and my ears. And I went, this is, I can't believe people, number one, would come up with something like this. Number two, I can't believe anybody would post it on their wall. I stuck it on mine and I ranted and raved about it. Of course it happened. Of course it did. What is wrong with you? And by the way, this guy's evidence was just absolutely. He found some other guy named Mike Brown. And he put this other guy, Mike Brown, that died around that same time. I don't know where he's from, California or something like that. Alongside the picture of Mike Brown from Ferguson. And he wants you to think they're the same guy. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, oh, that's easy. These are not the same people. What is wrong with you? If you, if you spread it out there and it's not true, then that makes you a liar. And people won't believe you anymore. Why don't you just stick to scriptures? Why don't you just put scriptures on your Facebook page and make YouTube videos about scriptures instead of some some wild-haired, crazy man conspiracy theory 
that you concocted that makes you look smarter than the Illuminati. Anyway, that's my rant for today. Actually, this whole two-hour thing is a rant and rave of Mike Hoggard. Jeremiah 25, 4, The Lord sent unto you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not hearkened nor inclined your ear to hear. Nehemiah 9, 26, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and had cast thy law behind their backs and slew thy prophets, which testified against them to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocations. You know who, you know who slays the prophets? People who hate the Bible. And they threw the King James Bible behind their back, and they walked away from it. Luke eleven forty nine. 49, Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them shall, they shall slay and persecute. That was Nehemiah. Cast thy law behind, them back, behind their backs, slew the prophets which testified against them to turn them to thee, and they wrought great provocations. What is the goal? What's the purpose of the prophet? It's to turn people to God. See, remember, I said the two tests were, number one, um, accuracy, infallibility. Number two, direction. What direction are they trying to turn everybody? And you can actually, you can actually tell from most of these latter-day prophets and dreamers of dreams that you can tell they're not trying to draw people to God. Who are they trying to draw people to? Themselves. They want, Dr. Awar wants the credit. He wants you to think that he is high up with God, so you better listen to him. You better give him your money. You better send your teenage daughters with him to his prayer retreat. I didn't make that up, by the way. You better do what he says because God has selected him to be a prophet in these last days. You better do what he says. And you can tell these guys, they're not trying to get you to follow after God. They're trying to get you to follow after them and, and pay their bills and buy fuel for their jets, their private ones. That's what they're trying to get you to do. There are prophets in the Old Testament, apostles in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles and gifts of healings, helps governments, diversities of tongues. You saying, you don't believe that, Pastor? I do. I absolutely believe it. I believe God set forth apostles, and they're listed in the Bible. Every one of them are listed in the Bible. And there are no apostles in these days but the ones who are listed in the Bible. Period. The end. You don't believe in prophets? It says right there, secondarily prophets. Let me show you something. Do you know what the biblical definition of the word prophet is? Let's do this. Let's do this. Let me click that and click that and click that. And let's go here, okay? Let's go to Ezekiel. This phrase, son of man, was used over and over and over again in the book of Ezekiel. God called Ezekiel the son of man. And here's what he said over and over to Ezekiel. And I've got to find the verse now. Here, hang on here. Son of man, do this. Uh, son of man, son of man. Now watch me not be able to find it. Hang on here. Oh, we're getting close. Here we go. Ezekiel 13, 2. Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. When he says prophesy, what does that mean? It means they say the word of the Lord. There it is right there. Read that verse. Son of man, 
prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. Do I believe that people can prophesy in these days? Absolutely. Absolutely. I even believe that daughters can prophesy in these last days. I do. Daughters can. Sons and daughters shall what? Prophesy. I believe it. Prophecy is saying the word of the Lord. That's what prophecy is. Male or female. Ladies, make up, you know, how you, how you like to design things. Make up some of these little graphics like you see on Facebook all the time and put nice scripture there with butterflies and cursive script and little flowers and put that on Facebook. Do that because you're not only allowed to, God blesses it. I'd say do it. Um, that question came up to me uh, first year I was out in Kenya in uh, Rongo. They were, some of the pastors were asking me questions on some things I said. The Bible says, let the women keep silent in the church. The pastor, do you believe that women uh, can be pastors? The answer is no. They cannot be shepherds. They cannot be bishops. They cannot usurp authority over man. What, what, it, what about it, what it says in Joel chapter 2? Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. They said, that's not what you asked me. Can they prophesy? Absolutely. There have been women missionaries for years going to different places in Africa, handing out gospel tracts, reading, reading the Bible to children. Um, some even hold Bible studies where they read the Word of God and, and let people discuss it. That's prophesying. But You've seen man and woman in churches who jump up, they grab the microphone, they start talking about this vision and the conversation they had with God, Beth Moore, and um, they want you to think that God is giving them fresh revelations, and it's all in an attempt to draw you, not to God, but to them, Beth Moore. Because that's who she is. She has these visions. She has these conversations with God. And you're going to pay $22.95 for the next book that she writes. That's what that's all about. So, can, can you women, can you prophesy? Absolutely. As long as you stick with the scriptures of the prophets. The word of of the Lord. You stick with it, all right? Uh, let's see here. Where else here? So I believe that God has given these things. He's given the offices of apostles, prophets. Let me go back here. Um, apostles, they wrote doctrine. Anybody who calls himself an apostle now thinks that they can write doctrine. Prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. I believe in all of that according to the Bible. Not according to man, according to the Bible. Now, here's the biggie right here, and you just can't get past this one if you believe the Bible. You cannot get past this. You've heard me use this many times before, but to me, it just it means something. These are not just words. This is part of our contract with God. God is swearing to us that he's not going to change the terms and the conditions of the contract once you accept it. He's not going to change it on you. Whereas people love to change God's contract. But the author of the contract said... As of this point, right here, 
There will be no more words added. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. See, there it is. The words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to tell you in love, but it's going to be a very stern warning. Those of you who may be listening who think that you're getting messages and prophecies from God, be careful. I wouldn't trust it. But I would go to the written word of God to see whether these things are true or not. You hear me talk about how God deals with me. Have I ever heard an audible voice from God? No. Never heard that. Have I heard things in my mind or heart, my soul, inside here somewhere where I felt like God was telling me certain things? Yes. But in every case, I'll give you an example. I will give you an example. I felt like at one time God was leading me to study numbers. I can't tell you that he said something. I just felt the Holy Spirit drawn to study numbers. So I read Ed Vallow's book, which is a good book. Uh, he's now gone on to be with the Lord. I read E.W. Bullinger's book, which I wasn't that impressed with. But the, the, in both books, they gave a list of what the numbers meant. And I looked at that, and I said, God, that's fine. I, these, I'm assuming these were your men, but I'm not satisfied with that. God, will you show me in your word what the number one means, what the number three means? What does five mean? What is ten? What is seven? What is six? God, show me in your word these numbers. Show me what they mean. And I remember praying one day. I wasn't in some trance. I wasn't speaking in tongues. I was just at, me and God were talking. And I said, God, I want to know what these numbers mean. And in my spirit, I heard, look at the Genesis chapter. That's the meaning. Now, I didn't just accept that. Because I know in my mind, my mind can play little games with me. Hi, Mike. I'm God. Okay? I don't, I don't trust everything that I hear in, in here somewhere. But I see it in the written word of God. So I went to Genesis chapter 1. Sure enough, that's, you know, number 1, the beginning. This is the first thing. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The number two was for union and division. Well, here Adam is taken. He's divided in two, and he's brought back together. The two shall become one. And I went, okay, that's pretty cool. Number three dealt with the Godhead and resurrection and sin. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Genesis chapter 3. Um, number four, there's a gospel story in Genesis 4. Cain, who was of that wicked one, slew Abel, the righteous. I just went to the Genesis chapter. There they are, right there. Everything's in order. Everything's. That's how I know the thing came from God. Test the spirits, it says. Test the spirits. The spirits don't normally talk to you in your ears audibly. Spirits are going to speak to you in your mind. You test them to make sure they're of God. So in the sense where I say God, God dealt with me and God said, Mike this, God, God said, Mike that, I don't accept that unless I go to the Word of God to find where God said it here. Then I know God said it. Now, there has been times... 
when God has intervened in my life or God has helped me by quoting Scripture to me. That's of God. Um, there, was, there was one time, I mean, I was just, I, I was just down and out. I felt like I, had just, I, I just wanted to run, just wanted to leave. And I didn't understand why I felt the way I did. And I prayed and I prayed and I prayed, and then all of a sudden, I heard in my spirit, smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And immediately I realized what was going on. I knew that it was from the Lord because he quoted Scripture. God will quote Scripture. The Holy Ghost will draw you to Scripture. The Holy Ghost will say things to you, but he is going to verify them in the Scripture. That's the test right there. It's always, always leads to the Scripture. So God said... If they add to the words, there's a plague added to them. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. And that you know what that is? Not everything that God does is in the Bible, Mike. And some of that stuff in the Bible is not right. They just broke the contract. That's what God said. And, and to me... When I read this right here at the very end of the entire Bible, that is God signifying to me, Mike, there are no more prophecies. I'm not holding back some, waiting for the right person to come along like Joe Smith or um, uh, Charles Taze Russell or Ellen, um, Ellen White. I almost said Ellen Degenerate. I'm not waiting for these people to show up so I can give them the real revelations. They're right here in this Bible. Search no more for them outside. They're all right here in the Scripture. I don't know about you. I believe that one. Now, I like this. Numbers eleven twenty nine. 29. Moses said unto him, Envious thou for my sake, would, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his Spirit upon them. I believe it. And there, Joel chapter 2, 28, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy when? When he pours out his spirit upon all flesh. I believe that. I believe that all of the Lord's people are prophets, that they should be prophesying by doing what? Hear the word of the Lord. Quote scripture. Give them Isaiah. Give them Peter. Give them Paul. Give them Jesus. Give them a little bit of Moses. Give them some David. Give them the word of God. Give them something that when they hear it, they can pick up a Bible by themselves and verify whether or not these things are true or not. That's what you give them. Because I promise to you, you people out there, that are pulling the wool over people's eyes by making them think that you're a prophet of God. I guarantee you, some of these people that you're trying to deceive are Bereans. And they're going to, even if you won't, and even if you warn them against it, they're going to sneak around behind your back and open their Bible to see whether or not these things are true or not. And when they find out that you lied through your teeth, they're not going to keep silent about it. They're going to expose you for who you are. That's what they're going to do. When I left, I went to see this guy. Dan Bowler was his name. I don't know where he is. I don't know what he's doing now. At that time, he was up in Kansas City. That should have rung a bell for I didn't know about the Kansas City prophets back then. Dan Bowler comes to St. Louis, and he's telling, telling everybody. He's prophesying over St. Louis that there's going to be tanks in the streets, and there's going to be baby stealings. They're going to be taking babies out of hospitals in mass, and all these things. None of them happened. None of them happened. I left that meeting, I wrote everything that he said down, and I said, God, I'm confused. I don't, know that he, I don't know that he heard from you. I don't know that he didn't hear from you. God, I don't know. I want to know. I want to know. I want to know the truth. Because, God, you said your word is true and every man's a liar. So, if God, what this, if what this man said is true, I want to see it in the Bible. I want to see it in the Word of God. I want to see it in what I trust. Maybe God didn't make everybody like me, but God made me to where if it didn't come out of my Bible, I don't believe it. 
I don't believe it. I'm just, I'm just hard-headed that way. But God said I could be. God said that I could be that way. Uh, let me get to... Let me see here. Da, 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 da. Let me get to the, some... Um, here we go. Here we go. All right, you ready for this one? What time is it? Man, I could, I could go another two hours with this. I'm enjoying myself. By the way, while I'm saying this, Thursday, there will be no Pastor Mike online Thursday. Aww. I'll be stuffed turkey on Thursday. Thursday is Thanksgiving in America. Uh, and those of you living in America... You better be thankful for what you have because we're living in times right now. Do you think this Ferguson thing is going to die down? I don't think it will. I think there are people who want to take advantage of this situation to change this country, not for the better. You better be thankful for what you have because it could be gone. Okay? could be gone. They, it could overnight, it could go away just like those stores they burnt down. Um. Go to uh, some of the local news affiliates in St. Louis, uh, fox2now.com, KMOV. Um, K I can't remember all the, the news names. They, all of them have pictures of Ferguson from last night. And the, the things that you and I hold dear in this nation right now could be gone up in smoke just like that. Tell God thank you. Solomon said, For in the multitude of dreams and many words there are also divers vanities, but fear thou God. Jeremiah 23, 32, Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams. Can it happen? Yes. God said it would happen. And God said, I'm against them. I'm never for them. If they prophesy a dream and it's false, I'm not for them. Do tell them and cause my people to err by their lies. So he said, I'm against them that prophesy false dreams and then tell the dreams and then cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore, they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. God said, I'm against them. They're causing my people to not know the truth, to err. Jesus said what? You do err. How? Not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. You know how you can keep from being lied to and deceived by these dreamers of dreams and these visionaries and these prophets? You know how you can keep yourself from being deceived? Know the Bible. Know the Bible. Know what it says. Or pray and ask God to shield you from deceit. And he will, because you know what the Bible says? The very elect cannot be deceived. Very does not designate a higher level of election than what other people have. The word very means true. Those who are truly elected of God, if it were possible to deceive the very elect, but it is not possible to deceive those who are truly elected of God. God will shield you with faith. Faith in the word of God. He will protect you from those things. But even if someone says something and you're going, well, I can't think of any scripture that denies it, the Holy Spirit is going, uh, I know some. And if you'll give me a little while, next time you sit down and read your Bible, I'm going to show it to you. That's what he'll do. Uh, let's see here. Zechariah 10.2, for the idols have spoken vanity. Look at that. That's all those, those, those Mary statues that cry tears. They spoke in vanity. There will, I got I to gotta tell you this. I used to have, I used to have the, the footage of this. Benny Hinn was talking to Oral Roberts on the Benny Hinn show. Some of you will get that. Some of you won't. It's the Benny Hinn Show. And Benny Hinn was talking to Oral Roberts. And 
Benny was at this church, and their story was that God manifested his seal of approval on Benny Hinn because as the sun shone through the glass on the side of the church house that he was in, on the back wall behind the pulpit, there was this image of Jesus there portrayed on the wall, and it stayed there for weeks, they said. And Benny Hinn said that every time he got up to preach, as he talked, the mouth of that image moved while Benny was preaching. And Oral and Benny were saying, that was God's approval on your ministry. That was God showing everybody that he sealed and he approved your ministry. Bless God. The idols lied. The idols spoke vanity. It was a, number one, I'm not even sure that it ever happened. Number two, even if it did, even if it did, Number one, that's an idol. That's a sign. Here's the prophet giving you a sign, and those people fell for it. And all you have to do is listen to what they say, and if they tell you something that's not in the Bible, that idol, that idol lied to you. Uh, for the idols have spoken vanity, and the diviners have seen a lie and have told false dreams. They comfort. The word comfort, type, let's do this. Let me show you something. They comfort. C-O-M-F-O-R-T, 66 times in the, King, in the 66 books of the King James Bible. That's your word comfort right there. They comfort in vain. Therefore, they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. Proverbs 123, turn ye at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. God's spirit equals God's words. They are one and the same. Isaiah 59, 21, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. My spirit and my words always work together. They shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord from henceforth forever. God said he's going to preserve his word. Zechariah 7, 12, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law, and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets, therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Are you catching this? They should hear the law, the, Lord, the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit. The spirit and the words and the law, the covenant, always goes together. Always. They're not separate from one another. John 3.34, For he whom God hath sent, Speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The words of God, the Spirit of God. John 6, 63, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit. Words are Spirit, and they are life. The Spirit quickeneth, the words quicken. That means they are made alive. What did Jesus do to make Lazarus get up out of the grave? Did he do CPR on him? Did he give him a, an injection? No, he spake, and his words brought him to life again. Galatians 3, 2, This only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit, by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. I told Stan that I had asked God to give me dreams one time, and God said, I'm going to give you the Bible. That's better. Just take the Bible. And I said, God, I'm fine with that. Stan looked at me, and he said, I can give you an impartation of that if you would like. I could lay hands on you and impart dreams and visions to you if you want to. And I said, no, no. 
Why would I come to you for you to give me something that God has already told me? No. I've got something better for you, Mike. Why would I accept something less than the absolute Word of God? And by the way, have you ever heard some of these people's dreams that dream dreams? They're weird. They're like, yeah, and I saw like I was like at the shopping mall, and the lady at the mall that was, uh, you know, was in a store, was in a jean store, and the lady that was checking me out, she had an eagle's head on her, and her, her hands that she was using to hit the cash register with, um, they were like barbecue tongs. I mean, that's kind of the, I just made that up. That's the kind of stuff, or did I make that up? That's the kind of stuff that these people who dream these dreams tell you. They're weird. And then they'll say, now here's what I think the interpretation is. And you're just going, where in the world did that come from? But anyway, these guys, these latter-day prophets are going around saying, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. Come here and let me give you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to lay hands on you and give you the Holy Spirit. Paul said you get the Spirit by the hearing of faith, not by hand slapping you on the head. You know how you get the Holy Spirit? Hearing by faith, hearing of faith. You hear the Word of God, you believe it, God gives you His Holy Spirit. That's how you get it. I'm about to run out of time here. Second Thessalonians 2. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with what? The spirit of his mouth. In Revelation 19, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. You see how they're connected? God is going to destroy the Antichrist with whatever that is that's coming out of his mouth, and it just happens to be a sharp sword. What do you think that is? It's the Bible. Now, let me, oh, I didn't even show you this. I didn't even click the thing. You're not even looking at it. There we go. Now, watch this. Anybody that is under the influence of false doctrine, the spirit behind that false doctrine can be absolutely and totally destroyed by the Word of God. Look at that. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword. I have had people email, write, call, come by and visit, who said, yeah, we were in the Hebrew Roots stuff. We were in the Foursquare Church. We were in the Charismatic Movement. We used to be Mormons. We were in all of these. We were following this. We were following that. We believed it. And then we heard some guy named Mike Hogger talk about the King James Bible. And we started reading it. We started reading the King James Bible. And all of a sudden, we found out that the lies that were being told to us in the Hebrew Roots Movement and all these other things, we found out that they were lying through their teeth. And God has absolutely destroyed those doctrines in our minds and our hearts and we don't believe them anymore we just believe what the bible says that I, you start telling me that stuff man i start crying because that blesses my heart because god made you god destroyed that wicked and the spirit of antichrist that was on you god destroyed that spirit with one thing and one thing only well, the written word of god the sharp sword that comes out of the mouth of jesus himself Oh, I got, a, I got a lot more here, but I've got a turkey to tend to. Um, there will be, I think, a Watchman broadcast come out uh, this weekend. Adam 2.0, part of the Singularity series. I think. I haven't recorded it yet, but I think it's ready. So anyway, God bless you. I love you. Uh, we'll get together sometime next week. We'll visit. All right? We'll see you.